What is up, fellow nerds, and welcome back to the Dapper Snapper Gaming Channel, and welcome back to How Do I Want to Do This? This is our series where we take a look at all playable options available to players in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, then we rank them on a scale of 1 to 10 and either build them or fix them depending on how they rank. Now, today we start covering a little bit of homebrew. Um, I did promise for this series we were going to look at all regular subclasses within the D&D canon, as well as anything created by Matt Mercer, because let's be real, Real. pretty much anything created by him is essentially canon so this is a subclass called the gunslinger and it is basically all but official uh, this of course is the signature subclass of percival from campaign one of critical role and it uh, it gives you some interesting ways to use firearms in dnd 5e is it any good We'll just have to find out today, but before we do that, make sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe if you haven't already. At time of recording, we are less than 10 subscribers away from 2,000. So please, we just need a few more to push us over that edge. I was hoping to get there by Christmas, and I think we are very much going to do that. Uh, but again, I need your help for that last little push, and then we can go ahead and start uh, start getting ready for next year's goal. And I'm excited to uh, see where that goes. Of course, once you've done that, make sure you click the bell so you're notified when new videos are uploaded, and share the video with your friends. Before we jump into our subclass analysis today, I did want to have a bit of a preamble with this, because this subclass comes with with its own set of challenges. What I mean by that is anytime you introduce firearms into a campaign, whether it is a subclass that is completely devoted to it or just as a weapon in general, there is going to be an aspect of make sure it's okay with your DM. There are going to be a lot of places within this subclass that I'm going to say talk to your DM. And I find that that's pretty common anytime that firearms are introduced. Um, I did do a poll yesterday on the channel and a, more than half of you said that either you're allowed to use firearms or no one's even asked. Um, there were very few of you that said that you are just straight up not allowed to use them at your table. So I felt a lot better about actually covering this and that they are allowed. However, there are some interesting ways that these interact with the core rules. And there are interesting ways that Matt Mercer has changed the optional rules found in the Dungeon Master's Guide as well. And so we are going to go through what he has. We're going to talk a little bit about the original rules, and we're just going to have to see where this subclass kind of ends up in the grand scheme of all of the fighter subclasses. With all that out of the way, let's jump in. Starting off at level three, we get several features here. Now, a couple of them are, are more formalities than features, in my opinion, which, which is kind of an interesting take on this subclass. There is an entire section of new rules about firearms that is listed here. Um, so that's not really a feature, it's just new ways to play with firearms. Um, you get firearm proficiency, which is the very first thing, which is counted as a feature, but it's also more of a formality because if you don't have that, you can't use the subclass as it's intended. So I'm not gonna rank firearm proficiency because you needed that just to function. Um, we'll, we will talk about the firearm properties in passing, but that's also not a feature. So it, it's interesting that they, that they listed these all in the same section, but it is what it is. The first proper feature that we get is gunsmith. And this gives us proficiency with tinkers tools, which allow us to craft ammunition at half the cost. We can repair our firearms and we can even draw up and make new ones now here we have our first of several instances of it is up to dm discretion and this makes it a nightmare to rank because one dm is going to say you have to go get you know a tooth of an adult red dragon just to make the trigger you have to go to this volcano and and jump in and do all this to get this uh you have to kill a Goliath tree to make this up. Like there are going to be people who are going to make these, these big quests. Not that that's not fun, but it's difficult. And so that's going to make this a lot more, a lot harder to, to make what you want happen where you're going to have others, where you walk into a town, roll persuasion, and you just get the stuff. That's a lot tougher for me to be able to rank when you just leave it completely up to the DM. And so I really wish that there were some more hardline rules here on, on crafting some of the more powerful weapons in the game. That makes it hard. Now, it's all but two have all of these parameters around them. So it's not like it's the majority. Um, it, it is the vast minority, actually, that, that have these weird things. 
but a lot of people are going to be going for that bad news because it does so much damage um, and the hand mortar isn't terrible it's a nice little reliable fire damage explosion kind of thing and so people are going to want to do that but it just says craftable it doesn't say what goes into it and and that ends up making this a really difficult thing to rank for me it's nice having extra tool proficiency but like i've said a lot of times tools aren't all that great for you you're going to be using them a lot so you're going to get a little bit more use out of it than your typical person because you're crafting ammunition because you're repairing your firearms if they get broken which we'll talk about here in a little bit um so we're going to be able to rank that a little higher however because there's so much dm discretion when it comes to these certain firearms that people are going to want that also throws off the ranking so i'm going to give this an eight out of ten i don't think that those two weapons should dictate super heavily what i do rank this as however it does have to come into effect being able to save money on ammunition is great you're going to be needing to constantly either get your ammo back, which is highly unlikely because it's bullets, um, or you're gonna have to be constantly crafting them, which costs money. So you are going to constantly be broke because you're constantly trying to get metal to craft all of these bullets. That is one thing, is that you need a lot of money to be a gunslinger. And that is one thing that's not really discussed in this. And uh, it's definitely an issue that, uh, that needs to be solved in, in a build. Um, you've gotta find ways to, to get a lot of money. So however however you can work that out with your with your dm um, of course you need to be able to repair your damaged firearms that's absolutely essential because they will break on you they will misfire they will jam um, and and we'll talk about that in a second but i think eight out of ten is more than fair because of the extra use that you get out of those tinker's tools and plus you get every other use of tinker's tools which out of the list of tools tinker's tools really is pretty far from the worst Next, we have firearm properties, which this is not technically a feature. This is just alternative rules that you can use instead of those that are presented in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Now, the Dungeon Master's Guide gives you some optional rules for firearms and gives you a couple of what they call the Renaissance weapons, right? Things like the muskets, the pistols, you know, when, when you think of really, really old guns, that's really kind of what comes to mind with this. With this take on it, with the Gunslinger, it gives you many more options and abilities to make them a little bit more streamlined. Um, they don't necessarily say you need X amount of metal, you need X amount of wood. Um, you don't even necessarily need a wood carver's kit, which is a little interesting um, that you can, you know, carve the wood with Tinker's tools. But I'm not going to complain because then that's one more thing that I've got to go after. Um, but it gives you some some different features to apply to these weapons, and some of them are good some of them are a lot more difficult to work around speaking of difficult let's start at the top with reload all firearms have the reload property which makes sense right you've got to put new bullets in the chamber in order to fire them however this isn't just some fancy you know it happens as part of the action it happens on a bonus action even the weapon can be fired a number of times equal to its reload score. Most of the weapons have a reload score of one. There are a few that have it a little bit higher, but it's it's more rare. Um, but you then you have to spend an attack or an action to reload. And you have to have a free hand in order to reload a firearm. So to me, that means absolutely no shields. That means that you are going to constantly be using your extra attack feature to reload. That kind of sucks. And now you probably are realizing why the damage dice are so high on these weapons because you can only use them once per turn with extra attack. Without extra attack, you're attacking every other turn with something that has a reload score of one that kind of sucks right that that makes this really really tough and it, it honestly ends up making your damage just go down and down and down when we're when we're thinking about this overall so that's a very limiting factor to me and and that that takes your damage down to a place where yes it's comparable to certain things but i mean you're you're still looking at being incredibly outclassed by casters very quickly um, even once you get extra attack, you're still only making one attack per turn on a weapon with a one reload score. The only weapons that have more than one is the pistol, which is a D10, and it has four. So you can go two turns 
assuming you don't action surge. You can go one turn if you if you action surge, and then you've got to use one attack, and then you can fire three more bullets, and it just it just ends up getting really weird. There's a lot more to keep track of. You also have the pepper box, uh, which is, again, 1d10. Um, it's a lot more expensive to make, but it has a reload of six, which is is fine. Again, that's fine. You, you do have a higher chance of misfire, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Um, but yeah, that reload property is, is pretty tough uh, in, in keeping your damage in check. The misfire feature is, again, not a feature, it's more of a detriment. Whenever you make an attack roll with a firearm, if the attack roll is equal to or lower than the misfire score, the weapon misfires. The attack misses and the weapon cannot be used again until you spend an action to try to repair it. You then have to make a tinker's tool check, but if you fail, the weapon is now broken and cannot be used for the rest of the combat unless you take time to fix it. Now. The interesting thing is that it doesn't give you a time frame on fixing it, and it doesn't tell you whether or not the mending cantrip has anything to do with this fixing it. It just says mended out of combat. I, I don't I don't know how I feel about that because to me it says it's broken and needs to be mended, which sounds like the mending spell, right? Which just is an action rather than having to spend money and take time. So eh, that's that's another 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 tough point here um, and of course if if a creature who is not proficient with firearms uses it it increases that misfire score by one to me that extra misfire score is not nearly as detrimental as just the lack of not rolling with your proficiency bonus so i, I don't think that's nearly as much of a problem um yeah it, it's not that big of a deal the explosive property is next and this only applies to the hand mortar now the hand mortar to me is another problematic weapon because again it just says craftable it doesn't give you actually a cost or a means to make it it is all dm discretion so there's an entire feature just with this, and, and it's just saying that there is splash damage. They have to make a dex save if they're standing next to the target. Um, and so I, I don't know how many people are using the hand mortar. I, I would imagine that this is probably used a little bit less unless you're making a dedicated build for it. Um, and, and in that case, that's that's different. But to me, I feel like this is a little bit uh, a little bit less common because it only has a 30 foot short range. While it has a 600 foot long range, which is nuts, I, I do think that that, uh, that that 30 foot long range is a little limiting at times uh, because you're probably gonna want to not be within running distance of most of your enemies as a ranged fighter. Uh, you, you probably don't wanna be that close, in, in my opinion. Um, and then finally, the ammunition property, which this is pretty standard. Um, ammunition property is already a thing in D&D, so we don't need to really worry about this. It, it works pretty much like you're used to as far as, far as that goes, so um, nothing crazy there. As far as the types of firearms go, here they are up on the screen along with their respective properties. Um, as far as ones that kind of stand out to me, of course, bad news is awesome. 2d12 piercing is amazing, right? However, when you think about the fact that it reloads on a one, that's a little tough because you do have to reload it every single turn. So essentially you have attack, reload, and so that was essentially two 1d12 shots. And then you've got the same thing again on your, if you action surge. Um, and so that, that can just get a little weird. The math is just gonna get very strange with this and just keeping up with whether or not your weapon is loaded at the time, keeping up with your ammunition, of course, if your table even does that. I know some tables don't keep track of it. I have a feeling because ammunition is such a big part of this, you probably will be keep keeping track of it a little bit more than you would with, say, arrows. Um, but ultimately, it's, um, it, it is a little bit different in that case. What is my favorite weapon on this list? The musket. I think the musket is going to be your most consistent weapon. Um, it's got a low misfire of two. It's got a reload of one, which is rough, but you've got a 120 foot range and a 480 foot long range, which is pretty impressive, to be honest. I, I think that's absolutely fantastic. A 1d12 piercing is really good damage. Um, I just, I don't know. I, I don't trust the bad news nearly as much, even though the only difference is the misfire is going up by one more. But that means you've got a 15% chance of misfire. 
and then you've got to make that check and it, it does say you just have to make that check i i assume that's an action um uh, that sounds like an action to me to fix a jam um and then i guess if you have the minting cantrip you could use another action and, and fix it if you break it um but yeah, I, I just I think that there's just a little bit that is just, just right there that needed to be explained a little bit more in order to make it more clear to everybody. But yeah, so as far as this goes, though, I, I do think that this makes firearms a little bit more difficult to use. It gives you a little bit more to think about and gives you some more flexibility with types of weapons. But at the same time, it also makes it more difficult because you now have things that you could just take the gunner feet and ignore the loading property, right? There's no loading property here. This says reload. It's not the same thing as far as I'm concerned. Maybe your DM will, will rule it otherwise. Again, there we go again with DM discretion. If your DM says that reload and the loading property are the same thing, then you're golden. Everything is great. However, if we're looking at this strictly rules as written, they are not the same thing. And so technically part of the gunner feat is not part of the gun slinger subclass which is not good uh so that that's that's tough and so that's again something to talk to your dm about i would imagine most dms are going to be gracious when it comes to this but i'm not going to assume anything and so of course if we end up making a build later this week i will be doing everything i can to get around this if i can because it is just that detrimental finally level three our fourth point here is finally the fun stuff we get to do trick shots, which is the whole reason that people do this, right? Now, a lot of these are very similar, if not almost identical to Battlemaster maneuvers, except it's based on your wisdom modifier rather than your level in fighter, which I, I wish that it was just based on your level in fighter because that's just one more stat for me to have to worry about. And I, I just, I think that's tough. But for now, we get two trick shots of our choice and we will eventually get four more. Um, so we will eventually get six of the eight available trick shots. And again, I would, because this is homebrew territory, I would talk to your DM about making some new ones, making some custom ones for your table. Um, we will not be going over any of that today, but I would encourage you to do that at your table because um, it seems like you're probably cool with homebrew. Um, we will come back to that because what fuels that is our grit points. Um, so we get a number of those equal to our wisdom modifier, which I don't like, but it is what it is. Um, we get one back every time we roll a 20 on the D20 for an attack with a firearm. So anytime we crit, we get one back. And again, throwing everything in the DM's hands here once again, deal a killing blow with a firearm to a creature of significant threat. What does that even mean? <laughs> like, I, I get that what he's trying to say here is you don't get a grit back for every little minion that you kill, especially if you're using the home rules of minions have one HP, right? You have to get the killing blow on a boss. You have to get the killing blow on a mini boss. You have to get it on a significant figure in town. You have to... But ultimately, right, it just, it ends up being so strange because then you're just going to end up fighting back and forth of, this guy was significant, right? Well, no, you don't get your grit back. Well, what do you mean this guy's not significant? He's whatever. And I just, I, I think anytime you put something up like that, I, I think that's just going to lead to confusion and it's going to lead to people getting upset. And I, I don't like it. I, I think that it should have been worded in a lot more of a concrete way. Um, and then, of course, you get all your grit points back on a short or long rest. Again, we might as well have just made it like the points that go into superiority dice. It should have just been like that, but it's not. And so I, even if it was just a number equal to your proficiency bonus, I think I would have been fine with that. And maybe if he rewrote this today, maybe he would change that. I, I just, I don't like the way that that's worded personally. Um, as far as saving throws go, if a trick shot forces a save, it's based on your dex mod, which is gonna be your best stat most of the time. So that's totally fine. Um, now we get eight possible shots here and we're gonna go through each of those individually. First up is the bullying shot and the bullying shot is very interestingly worded. Again, every time we hit these Matt Mercer subclasses, there are some really weird things in the wording. And we ran into that. We've run into this a bunch, actually. Um, we talked about it in the Echo Night when we when we looked at that. Uh, that'll be up in the iCard above with how you have to teleport within five feet of a creature that's being attacked. It says throws itself in front of the attack. 
But then when you look at the actual technical side of it, there is no such restriction. And so you could end up behind cover as long as you're within five feet. You could end up behind the creature, which gives a plus two to AC to the echo that is now hiding behind the creature. There are a lot of weird things about this, and it's just small insights, I think, on Matt Mercer's part, which is fine. I just I just think that um, maybe there should have been a little bit more editing and maybe a few more eyes to look at this before things like this got published. Of course, Gunslinger was very early in 5e um, because they moved over from Pathfinder, I believe, when they went when they did campaign one, and this was just kind of a, a, a remnant of that. Um, but ultimately, I, I think that it's it's a little haphazardly worded in certain places, um, and, and that ends up showing, such as with the bullying shot. The bullying shot says you can expend one grip point while making an intimidation check to gain advantage on the roll. While it says you can use a powerful blast and thundering sound of your firearm to shake the resolve of a creature, the application of it, again, there, there's a difference in writing these things between the flavor portion of oh cool, this is what it does, and then what it actually does in the mechanics. So flavor and mechanics are two different sentences, they mean two different things. So you, you can't say throws itself in front of the attack, but then just say it must just be within five feet. You have to say it is within five feet of melee attackers or it needs to be between the target and, and you. Like you have to say that or else it doesn't count. And that's what happens here. You could use this just anytime you want and never touch your gun. And, and so that's like that. That's just weird, right? And so it's saying you have to have shot your gun. But yet it says while making an intimidation check, which is also technically an action, right? I mean, yes, talking is free, but like if you're making that check and you it just it just doesn't work it, it doesn't work within the way that the rules work i just i just i don't like it i don't like it i, I think it's worded in a in a poor way let's keep moving dazing shot whenever you make a firearm attack against a creature you can expend one grip point to attempt to dizzy the target on a hit the creature suffers normal damage and must make a constitution saving throw or suffer disadvantage on attacks until the end of their next turn that's pretty good right and this makes total sense to me now what i wish happened is that you get grit dice or at least you can add extra damage to your your shots here kind of like the kind of like the battlemaster fighter can um you're, you're gonna see me comparing this to the battlemaster fighter in a lot of ways and in a lot of ways it's just not as good and and honestly battlemaster fighters kind of make better gunners than gunslingers in in certain ways and that's kind of that's kind of sad that's Kind of sad in, in how it's written, but Constitution saving throws, again, that's a terrible one to, to have to target. I would much rather that have been a wisdom saving throw. Um, but I mean, if you're trying to dizzy them, I guess it makes sense. But yeah, Constitution, they're going to pass that a lot. So that's going to be tough. Um, but it is what it is. It's a nice effect if it works out. They, they have disadvantage on attacks until the end of their next turn. I mean, that's that's decent, right? That, that's not the worst thing. Um, dead eye shot, when you make a firearm attack against a creature, you can expend one grit point to gain advantage on the attack roll. That's really good. That's free advantage. Uh, I will always take that. Of course, you can only use one of these shots per shot. So you can't dead eye shot and dazing shot in the same bullet. Uh, you do have to do two separate attacks for that. But dead eye shot, I mean, that's fantastic. When you really need to hit, I would I would use that. That's that's pretty great. Um, disarming shot also very useful. On a hit, they take normal damage and they must succeed a strength saving throw, or they drop one held item of your choice and it is pushed ten feet away from you. That's great. I absolutely love that. Being able to knock items out of creatures' hands is really really nice. If it is a creature that just has a sword and you knock it out of their hand and then your barbarian runs up and takes their sword, all they have are unarmed strikes. And I mean, against a barbarian, they're not going to last long. So that can end a combat really quickly. If the powerful mage is carrying a staff of power and is about to blow you up, you can knock that out of their hand. That's pretty fantastic. Shield, knock the shield out of the hand. Now they are down to AC. There are so many amazing ways that you can use this. And of course, there is a battle master maneuver that does this exact same thing. And we talked about that a long time ago. 
it's really good because that that is absolutely fantastic this is actually better than the battlemaster maneuver because it actually knocks it back 10 feet they actually have to move to it it's not just harmlessly at their feet um so that is an improvement which which is great um forceful shot which is great they make a strength save or they're pushed back 15 feet we've talked about how amazing forced movement is on the channel this is no exception it's always good to be able to push people around it could put them into really bad situations they don't want to be in piercing shot is so weird to me um piercing shot whenever you make a firearm attack against a creature you can expend one grit point to attempt to fire through multiple opponents the initial attack gains a plus one to the misfire score on a hit, the creature suffers normal damage, and you make an attack roll with disadvantage against every creature in a line directly behind the target within your first range increment. Only the initial attack can misfire. So, this is weird. And there, there is a little bit of an oversight when it comes to the main rules that I honestly don't know if we are saying that this ignores or not. And that is the fact that creatures provide half cover to other creatures. We just mentioned it with the Echo Knight. If I'm shooting and trying to shoot through an enemy, which is what's happening here. Um, yes, we get a plus one of the misfire score, but I, I don't really care about that. I, I don't think that's that big of a, of a downside in my opinion. But it takes normal damage and then you make attack rolls with disadvantage. Do they get the plus two to AC? Because technically you are firing through that character and that is providing half cover. But at the same time, we're also saying that you weren't trying to shoot around that creature. You're shooting through that creature. And so with that argument, you could say that they don't get the bonus. So it's weird. Again, I, I would love to have had a clarification of this in the actual actual original writing i i think that that's just a, a bit of an oversight on his part and i think it should have been more clearly worded um i would assume that they don't i guess um and that's that's me being more more lenient i feel but i would assume that you can you can roll disadvantage and they not have the plus two but again talk to your dm because that's a rule that we're having to and a skirt around because of because of how this is worded um overall i i don't think that's that great of a shot i, I think it's it's kind of pointless um violent shot so for each grip point that you expend which you can expend as many as you want on this you get a plus two to the misfire score but you can make one additional damage die roll per grit point that you used this can be devastating really um yes you add plus two to the misfire score so you better not roll low but if you roll well this is pretty insane now the only problem with this is that we are not paladins with this we do not get to smite after we know that we have crit we have to choose to use the grip point and use the trick shot when we fire the gun we can't have seen the attack roll before we choose this so you have to say, I'm using Violent Shot, and then I'm pumping three grit points into it, so now you've got like a seven, right? You roll a six, your gun misfires, right? Sorry, it's wasted. You don't get to roll, oh, I rolled a 19, throwing Violent Shot in, for obvious reasons, right? So this is very much a double-edged sword. This can be really, really good if you roll high. This can be really, really bad if you roll low. And and really, even even when I say it's really bad, it's not any worse than any other misfire, which are gonna happen. Um, and, and I mean, in some cases against a big boss, this might be worth it to you. Um, although misfiring while staring down the barrel uh, and, and looking at another boss, that that might be a little, a, a little troublesome at times, but um, ultimately I don't think this one is all bad. Finally, winging shot. So when we hit, we can deal normal damage. And if they fail a strength save, they are knocked prone now it says winging as if it can only be used on flying creatures this can be used on anybody as far as i'm concerned and so this is the same as trip attack from the battle master maneuvers and we talked about how that is one of the best ones out there so this is a good this is a good shot so overall where do grit and the shots all come into play i'm torn because it gives you that extra flexibility which is nice however they don't provide extra damage you have to call it before you make the attack. So you could waste these, which is which is tough. 
Um, you don't have a like precision attack, which is a little tough. I, I really thought that there would be something like precision attack, um, which allows you to add a die to the actual attack roll. You do have the ability to give yourself advantage, which is good, but ultimately, you know, I, I, I feel like that's going to end up getting wasted sometimes. And so I, I'm not I'm not so keen on on that, unfortunately. Um, but as far as the trick shots go, most of them are OK. Um, they're not they're not all bad. There are a few that are just straight up bad, but most of them are OK. Grit is based on your wisdom modifier, which means we are now splitting our dexterity our wisdom, your constitution, and if you needed anything else, you're splitting that too. And so your some of your stats may not be the best on this build because you're having to split everything up a little bit. You do get those back on a short or long rest, which is good. So you're gonna have more than more than normal of, uh, of how most features work. But I would much rather have had, you know, proficiency bonus times per day or, or proficiency bonus times per short rest. I would have loved proficiency bonus times for short rest. I think that would have been would have been totally fine. Um, but yeah, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. Ultimately, I'm going to give this a 7 out of 10. It's not the worst kind of thing in the world. There are ultimately some really good benefits that come from this, but they are limiting in, in what they do. And again, some of them are really poorly worded in the grand scheme. And so I've got to dock some points for that. At level seven, we get quick draw and we can now add our proficiency bonus to our initiative and we can now stow a firearm and draw another as part of a single object interaction on your turn. Now, adding proficiency bonus to your initiative is always going to be a good thing. Would I have preferred it have been like you double your dexterity bonus? Sure, that would have been that would have been great. Um, but I mean, I guess this is this is fine, I, I guess. Or maybe even your wisdom modifier because that's based on your grit, but whatever, it, it's not a big deal. You get a bonus to your initiative, which is always gonna be good. You're gonna have a good initiative because you're a dex-based character. Um, and then of course, this is gonna scale pretty well with you. Stowing a firearm and drawing another one. Yes, this helps with the rules as written. Although this is a rule that I see messed up at a lot of tables. The fact that you can only draw or stow one thing at a time. And obviously to get around this, you could just drop one of your weapons and then draw one. You, you could do that too, instead of actually putting it away. So I, I don't know that that's going to be a huge deal overall. Um, I, I don't think you're going to get nearly as much use out of this as what it sounds. Um, but the initiative bonus is nice. Ultimately, I'm going to give this a 7 out of 10. Initiative bonus is always going to be a good thing. You always want to be able to go earlier and get yourself set up. But the other part of this may or may not be used depending on how you're ruling this at your table. At level 10, you get rapid repair. And so whenever your weapon misfires and needs to be fixed, you can actually do that as a bonus action now instead of an action. Now, again, earlier I was like, it doesn't say that it's an action. It's an action. But this allows you to make it a bonus action, which is pretty cool. Um, so you make the Tinker's Tools check as a bonus action. And, and if you end up succeeding, then you're good. And I would say most of the time you're going to because the misfire score, unless you went nuts on pouring in the violent shot, you're probably going to pass this a lot of the time with, with your bonus. Um, so you, you should be fine as far as fixing guns, especially at, at level 10. Um, so this, this is good. This saves you the attacks um, so that you can be reloading on your attacks rather than having to repair your gun instead. Overall, this is going to be a 9 out of 10. This is a great mechanical buff in helping out our action economy so that we're not having to fix our weapon. We can be reloading it instead, instead of shooting it. At level 15, we get Lightning Reload, and we now move that ever so terrible reload to our bonus action. Man, it's late to be getting something like this. Gosh, it is tough to wait 15 levels to move your reload to a bonus action. That honestly just sucks to me yes it's fantastic to be getting this and and i'm not i'm not ungrateful that we got this but man 15th level is absolutely insanely late to be able to reload a firearm as a bonus action you're using a lot of your turns depending on what type of weapon most weapons you're using half of your actions to reload and half of them are actually making shots if you miss an attack, you're doing no damage three actions in a row. Like that's that's just 
awful, right? And and so it's nice to have this. This allows you to be able to reload. However, you only get one bonus action. So you now can fire once, reload on your bonus action, fire again. Now you got to reload again. So your third attack is, is reloading. Then you can attack, reload, attack. So... But now your weapon's empty again, and so you, you, the next turn it starts over. And so it, it, just, it just ends up in this crazy cycle where, yes, it's better. You can make one more attack most of the time. But even then, the, just the reload property is just so detrimental uh, overall. It's just, it's just really hard not being able to ignore it. However, Lightning Reload is fantastic. It's really good to be able to help yourself out. Ultimately, the reload property is still a little much to deal with in my opinion and so ultimately i'm going to give this an 8 out of 10. it's good it's really good but the feature that it's set to fix is still quite overwhelming finally level 18 we get two features actually and they are vicious intent and hemorrhaging critical this actually expands your crit range to 19 or 20 and of course you also get a grit point back on a 19 or 20 as well because it's based on crits this is nice. However, this is also a feature that Champion Fighters got at level 3, that Hexblades got in a slightly more limited fashion, but still got at level 1. And so you're 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 kind of doing the math here, and it's like I, I waited 18 levels to get something I could have had at level 3 if I had gone a different subclass and just also brought a gun. So that's a little tough. Uh that's that's a little a little tough. Um so ultimately. I've got to give this a 6 out of 10. It's it's fine, but it's so late to be getting something like this. It's so late to be upping our crit range. I should be getting these devastatingly powerful abilities at this point, and I just get basically twice the chance to crit. And it's not even like I can I can crit fish for this stuff. It's the I can't even say I want to use my grit stuff after I roll. Oh, I got a crit, then I'm gonna pump a bunch of extra damage into it. I can't even do that. So ultimately it ends up just not being nearly as compatible as, as what it sounds. Finally, we get hemorrhaging critical and this allows you to actually deal extra damage when you deal a crit. So we have an expanded crit range, which is good, but whenever we score a critical hit with a firearm, the target actually takes another half of that damage from the attack at the end of its next turn. So you get to deal 1.5 times damage as you've uh, dealt it a, a devastating blow, and I will let you imagine whatever that is because I'm not gonna get into anything like that on YouTube. But I think that that's pretty cool, being able to deal a bunch of extra damage on a crit. As if the crit wasn't bad enough, the crit seems to leave a lasting injury. And that may be a, a mechanic to talk to your DM about. Again, there, there's another instance of that. Um, but hemorrhaging critical is pretty cool. And, and it's saying that you have, have left your mark on that enemy and it is, it is suffering badly. Um, this is a 10 out of 10. This is great. This allows you to deal a bunch more damage. The only thing that's holding it back is the fact that it's on a crit, which is only a 10% chance at this point. So ultimately you know it is a little bit limiting but um, i mean dealing extra damage on top of dealing a ton of damage on a crit i'm cool with that so now we have reached the end of our ranking and my goodness this subclass is interesting is it better than a different fighter that also has a gun and that is that is a tough question and in a lot of ways my answer is actually no, uh, and that, that might be surprising. I, I do like this subclass. I think it's got a lot of good ideas, but ultimately I think that they are worded in such a way that there are so many restrictions on what it is that you can and cannot do that make it kind of mediocre at best. Why would I not just take a musket and go battle master and I still get trip attack, which is the same as one of these, and I get to deal extra damage with that. I get to deal extra damage with any of those extra maneuvers that, that there are just a ton of those maneuvers, right? And it's not to say that you can't have maneuvers on this. Obviously you can take a fighting style and, and take superior technique and, and, and get access to one, but ultimately the gunslinger is not as good of a gunslinger 
as the battle master that also has a gun. And so that's tough. So we already know it's not a 10 out of 10. Uh, we, we already know that even with trick shots, even with all of this other stuff, like, like I said, firearm proficiency is just a formality. You can pick that up with gunner. You can pick that up with certain races. You can pick that up with, with other ways. Um, you get the tinkers tools thing. You could pick up tinkers tools from another, another way. Um, and then you can work out how ammunition works with your DM in, in another way. Um, like these are all kind of replaceable features in certain ways. And then the trick shots are really the only thing that are unique, but even then you can take basically the same thing on the battle master and deal extra damage on top of it, rather than it only being just these extra little effects. The only thing you're missing out on is the free advantage. That's it. And, and, and I, I think that that's just a little bit, um, a little bit tough quick draw. Of course, for using a two-handed weapon, that's going to be a little less applicable. Um, and like I said, certain tables aren't even going to be using those rules. Certain tables are just going to say, "Yeah, you can draw and stow in the same same interaction. Who cares?" And and you know, if that's how you play at your table, that's fine. It's not rules as written, but you know that that's that's totally up to you. And and I, I see that a lot at, at a lot of different tables where they'll allow you to do that, and and you know, and that's fine. But that makes this feature completely useless. Um, being able to reload on a bonus action is nice, but ultimately having to use an attack to reload all the time is rough when there are so many ways in D&D to get around the loading property. That just makes this a little bit difficult, in my opinion, and, and it ends up taking this down. Is it a bad subclass? I, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think it's the worst thing. I think it's a nice attempt, but ultimately the Battlemaster beats it out. I'm gonna give this a seven out of 10. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. And I, and I think it's got some, some interesting things to it. It's got everything it needs to be this self-contained marksman. And at the same time, like it, it wouldn't really work on any other chassis, at least the way that it's written. It, it has to be a fighter, something that gets a bunch of attacks. But at the same time, would I rather be a Battlemaster fighter that is firing my gun four times in a turn after level five, because I can ignore the loading property. Or would I rather be this, where I'm having to reload on every other shot and possibly waste three of my turns or three of my attacks rather, because I missed. I, I, don't, I don't like that. I, I think that that ends up being really, really detrimental. And I think it's going to end up feeling really bad for players after a while. So ultimately it's fine. We will build one on Friday and, and we'll talk about all of these problems. But, um, but ultimately if you're going to play a, a gun user, I would just go battle master. So that is all for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know what you think down below. Later this week, we're going to be building one of these together and seeing if we can make it work. Like I said, it's a little bit tough and I have built some firearm users in the past and I have not once used this subclass. I have, I have always used Battlemaster to build those and, um, and it can crank out some insane damage numbers. Um, but we are going to explore what we are capable of here and see, ju see just how far this subclass can push things. And I think you guys will enjoy that. So make sure to stay safe out there, stay healthy. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.